Welcome back to the Fuel Your Legacy podcast. Each week, we expose the faulty foundational mindsets of the past and rebuild a newer, stronger foundation essential in creating your meaningful legacy. We've got a lot of work to do, so let's get started. As much as you like this podcast, I'm certain that you're going to love the book that I just released on Amazon, Fuel Your Legacy, The Nine Pillars to Build a Meaningful Legacy. I wrote this to share with you the experiences that I had while I was identifying my identity, how I began to create my meaningful legacy, and how you can create yours. You're going to find this book on Kindle, Amazon, and as always on my website, samnickerbocker.com. Welcome back to the Fuel Your Legacy show. And today we have a special treat. Um, This is, I believe, the first of the kind of the show. I've never interviewed, to my knowledge, two guests at the same time. So I'm super excited. But really, when you get married, you you are the same uh, person. So it's really one guest, but it's two people. And I'm excited to see the kind of bounce between and the conversation. And maybe it'll give me some ideas for what I could do with my own wife, Charlie. She's amazing. Uh, But we have Liz and Jason Medwid on the call. And they are the, well, they they host their own podcast um, that really is to, if I'm not mistaken here, um, help people really get into music and and feel. I haven't listened to your podcast, so I'm I'm just being open there. But really, they they love the arts. They want to help people get into the arts and, and have a safe place to do that. So I'm going to let them introduce themselves a lot more. But one thing I do know about them is that they took what they were, they were passionate about their hobby. And they said, we're going to go do this full time. This is going to be our life. And they didn't live in the shadows. They decided to put it out in the floor. And that's why they're on here. So we're going to find out more about their story and ask lots of questions about it. So go ahead, Liz, introduce uh, at least the beginning. And then maybe it'll get over to Jason. And we want to hear your story in detail. All the juicy details you didn't say to anybody else. You didn't tell any other podcast for this. Just say it. Words barred. Okay. Yeah. At least some juicies. <laughs> so sounds good, Sam. Thanks so much for that introduction. Uh, so I'm I'm Liz, and I'm here with uh, with my husband Jason, who's also my creative partner on the Smile Syndicate Music Hour podcast, which is a uh, twice weekly. It comes out Mondays and Thursdays. Um, comedy, fiction, and music uh, show. So it's kind of like a variety show that we have come up with the structure where it's uh, it's three songs and uh, two comedy segments uh, on, on each on each program, and it's set in a fictional town called Smileton, which is kind of loosely based on some uh, some things that we some other fictional towns, and also partly on on uh, the town that we that we live in. And um, and it's been a really long, really fun, also quite a difficult journey uh, to get to where to where we are now from where we started from. And I will turn that over to Jason because it all started with a dream with Jason's dream. I think I can say Jason's dream of becoming a, a musician, which was a long, a long time dream and something that was becoming a reality, but that we didn't have a way of actually transforming into reality at at that point this was about two to five years ago when it actually started yeah the where we're where we are today has been the product of a long a lot of work and a lot of different decisions being made along the way so when this whole thing started there wasn't a podcast uh, liz wasn't involved this was just, I was feeling the need to be creative in a new outlet. And I love playing music. I love playing guitar. And I was playing along to Rush albums a lot. And I learned to play guitar doing that. So I would just sit in the basement and play along to, with guitar. And eventually, you know, you know, we had kids and you start reevaluating parts of your life. And I was starting to think, you know, maybe I should be playing music with other people and not just be in my basement. So I went and tried out for a band. And I didn't get in, but when the going through that process, I realized what it, you know, what activities this person was doing and kind of what skill level they had. And I thought, well, I can do this. So I decided I was going to be a one man band. And now the next problem is, well, I don't know how to sing and I need a singer. So I'm going to have to go get singing lessons. So I went and took singing lessons for two years. All the while, I'm learning how to write songs and get songs together, and I decided I wanted to put out an album. So I didn't just work on one song. I worked on 12 songs, 
And that ended up taking about three years to pull together and a lot of challenges, a lot of setbacks. I'm trying to do it all myself. I don't know what I'm doing exactly. Um, a lot of doing things the wrong way and you don't realize that until you look back on it. It was a lot to bite off in one one go, 12 songs, and I had it in my head. I had to do everything in layers. So I would do all the drums for 12 songs and then all the bass for 12 songs and then all the guitars. And I recorded vocals three or four different times until I was happy. So it was just backbreaking work. We get the album out and uh, Liz was very supportive through the whole thing, but it was mostly just me just sweating in the basement and just trying to grind it out and get this thing out the door. We got it. We, we put, made it available. It got on streaming platforms. We have it on CD and Liz put it on Reddit and just said, Hey, my husband just finished an album. You should take a look. So it ended up being on the front page of Reddit for about uh, 28 hours or something like that. So we got flooded with newcomers and people who had never heard it before and all kinds of people are listening. But unfortunately we really didn't have a backup strategy and it took me three years to put that out. And it's sort of like, well, now what, like, what, what do we have to follow this up? And during that process, I had found myself wanting to, and I'm sure it's just rooted in being self-conscious. I needed to put a fictional construct around the music. It isn't me. It's not my name. It's part of a band. And it's not just me in the band. There are other fictional people in the band. And I created this whole fictional history of this band. This album that I put out was actually the 17th album by this band. And uh, Liz did 16 fake album covers. I, I, I had 16 fake album names. I created, like I listed all the songs on all those albums. Who wrote them? I wrote up fake album reviews for each of them. And just it was telling the story of this fictional band. And we started looking at the web stats and people were coming to listen to the music, but then people would be like, they're confronted with this monolith of material and they just didn't dig in. And I was like, well, what, what you know, what's going on there? And they said, it was probably too much. You just kind of dump this dump truck full of stuff on people. Like we should put it out in a different way. Like maybe you should do a podcast. So this begins the history of Miss Elizabeth. That's her name on the show being right. And me being wrong all the time. So she was right about a podcast. So I resisted it. It took two years until I came to the idea of, well, I could probably, you know, doing a song a week forever will kill me. So I can't do that. But what if I did 13 songs, called that a season, took a break, got more ready, and did season two, and just do it that way. So I did that, got one set of songs out the door, and then it went silent. I, I barely made it through that initial set. I had a buffer. I had three or four songs uh, buffered, and I thought, I'll keep up with it. And um, I won't, I'll, I'll be able to finish this, you know, in fine style. But I ran out of buffer immediately. And it was a struggle week to week to get the song finished just in time to get it out the door. Um, so that was kind of another stressful situation. So I wasn't doing things the right way. I was, I, w- I wasn't organized enough. And I was, I, I think I just hadn't done it enough. So it was taking too long. So it sat actually for about three years, life events happened. And finally, in 2018, um, I got the urge to do the podcast again. And uh, Liz, by this point, really wanted to kind of help because she saw from the p- previous time how much work it was. So we started up again and, I, and we talked about, okay, we want to do this. And we know that when you want to do anything creative and you want to get people listening to it, get people into it, it takes a lot of time. It's not just a, a flash and then you're suddenly, you have an audience. Like it grows organically over a long time. So we kind of talked about if we're going to do this, we're going to make a commitment. So we're not going to, we're going to make the decision to do it. And then we're not going to revisit that decision for two years. So two years we've made, we're starting 2018. We have to go two full years before we can even question whether we should keep going or not. So that we started going and uh, we started trying to market it in different ways. Um, and one of those ways was some of the comedy content I've been creating. So I, in that podcast, the original set, um, Liz had to argue me into even talking on it. I just wanted to put the song out and that's it. But so she convinced me to do like a one, one and a half minute introduction. And then soon enough, I'm doing little funny bits in there. I'm telling stories that aren't, you know, completely fictional. And those were the seeds of Smileton, which is our fictional town. 2018, I, I go back to that formula. I'm telling little stories up front. And we did a little thing called um, a mailbag segment where we pretended we had a bunch of fan mail to answer. So we went out. We went out to this park nearby. Liz shot it on video, and I just made up ridiculous answers to these questions. And she was laughing and engaging with me during that. And a friend who's been listening since the beginning said, "You, 
she needs to be on the show. The way you guys interact, that's fun to watch. Like you, you, she should be on with you every time. And Liz had been saying that since the begin, like the very beginning. She said we should be on together, and I said no one will want to hear that. And so I'm just no, no, no all the time. So she comes on, and suddenly we, we, a seven minute podcast became 13 minutes, became 28, became 43. And that first year, we really grew. Like we kept evolving the show, kept putting more and more content in it. So we went from one song with a funny little introduction to by April of 2019, it was three songs. One, uh, usually one new one, or every once in a while a new one, but then two older songs, and then two big comedy segments, and then fun stuff surrounding all that. So since then, it's just been a process of refinement, and just how do you get a podcast out the door consistently? Because the biggest sin to us was missing. We know people have people have a lot of choices when it comes to entertainment, to their podcasts, if you've got something that people like, and then you start frustrating them by being inconsistent with your delivery, they're going to get, they're going to say, I'm, I'm sick of this, turn you off, and then and someone else takes your spot on the rotation. So um, during, we kind of had, a, at the very beginning, we did have a buffer. So we were about two weeks ahead of where we needed to be. And we were all, that was all really good. Uh, and then in 2019, in the very beginning of 2019, um, I, I, was ha- I had had ongoing issues with my heart racing uncontrollably and i was just writing that off as being anxiety or a panic attack or something like that but it got to be too serious and eventually um i went to the hospital and then suddenly they were taking it very seriously indeed and they i got admitted immediately i was in critical care for 18 days they fixed it uh it's amazing what they can do now it's fixed now but during that i'm worried about the podcast like we're churning that the days are passing and the buffer's going down we have one show left oh now that's gone out now we have nothing so we actually set it up where Liz called me from the, while I was in the hospital and we did a show where you can hear, like it's a little pocket size version of the show, but you can hear the heart monitor and you can hear like beeping and booping of the hospital in the background. And we're, we always like to kind of think back on that because that's how important being consistent was and that's how important the show was to us. Um, we got through 2019, 2020 started, the world goes crazy in March and in April, we, we made the crazier decision to, you know, we've been doing a show a week. Why do we do two a week? Because we've been getting comfortable doing one. It's quote, you know, it's easy to get one out the door a week. Let's do two. Let's make it difficult. So that's been the story for the last year is we've been pumping out two episodes a week. Um, and it's, we're, we're doing different kinds of, co- like we've suddenly got twice as much space to play with. So we can tell our longer form stories about Smileton, about the crazy characters. There's, we've invented new segments. We started one recently called New Year's Resolution Update, where the idea is I, I get on and I say, well, anyone can shoot their mouth off in January about the resolutions they've made for the new year. But where are they in March, April? There, they're nowhere. You, won't, you don't ever hear about those resolutions again. So we have a thing where we, um, Liz has very l- simple life-affirming uh, resolutions. And I ask her, so you said you're going to sing a song every day. What's that? How's that going? And then she comes back at me with my resolutions that are just ridiculous, like pointless testing of my will, making things needlessly difficult for myself, completely unre- unrealistic. So there's a lot of comedy segments like that. Um, there's a horoscope we do called the Accuscope Horoscope. So I say, I don't look at the stars. I just calm my mind and let my inner mind tell me sentence messages, truth nuggets bubbling up from the magma of my id. And I'm giving once a month horoscopes and it's the most accurate horoscope in the world because there's nothing more accurate, nothing more scientific than the human mind. So then I just do these ridiculous predictions for the upcoming month and Liz is like the voice of reason. And then, you know, so you're telling me that all like one twelfth of the world will meet a stranger in a restaurant and they don't, you know, it, it, it just gets silly from there. Mm-hmm. So lots of different types of comedy. Uh, lo- the music is just meant to be fun and catchy. And it's the overall, like right now, like we've been um, reaching out, to meet, making new pro- podcast friends like you, just getting the word out and just wanting people to come along and uh, join the fun. It's really meant to be, this is a world where you can escape for a little while. It's nothing bad ever happens. Everybody's uh, an eccentric. Everybody's a crank. Everybody's got got something about them, and none of that matters. Everybody just gets along and smiled, and it's a fun place to be. And 
that's where the show is now. So we're, uh, you know, I told you about the buffer in 2019. We are right now in, in the mode of we've got a goal to record an episode every day, starting yesterday until Monday, and we'll have three weeks buffered. And then we can, mm-hmm. you know, get on with the other creative things we want to do with Smileton and yeah. the Smile Syndicate. And another thing that we're trying to do right now, Sam, because we've gone through this whole journey and it's really been years now and even more like more than it's been two years at least, but you could count it as being like five or six years if you go even even farther back. It's been like a a kind of a focus, like something that bothered us that was a like a hobby that was a priority really for both of us, because I always knew when when I first met Jason, he was always a musician. So that was never not part of our marriage, you know, was, was, was the music. So this has been a hobby, something that was important to both of us from, uh, from, from for, forever. So what we've really done is we've been able to build it now so that we're actually having an impact. We're actually reaching people and we're actually being able to hear back from them um, the kind of impact that we're having. And it, we're having enough of an impact where where we're very grateful that some of them are willing to actually support our our endeavor by way of saying, like, please keep doing it. Please don't stop. And they're just giving us a little a little bit of a tip, you know, just to say, you know, we want you to we want you to keep going. And so what we're hoping that we can do now by reaching out through the podcasting community, uh, as on your podcast right now, is to help other people who have this kind of a desire, who have some kind of a passion, but they don't really fully understand or, or have like a structural approach, you know, to, to getting it out there, to being able to transition from it being a hobby, something that is inside yourself, something that you're maybe doing for yourself, to something that is more of a project or something that you can actually do, which is still part of who you are and it's satisfying that, but it's actually having that kind of an impact or as you say, building your legacy, you know, it's actually having that kind of a real, real impact on people. You're actually taking what is yours, your passion, your so, your heart and soul, and you're crafting it in a way that is like, it has to be very, it becomes work, but you, you have to approach it in a certain way to make it practical for yourself to actually get it, get it out there. So you're preserving the art, you're preserving the gold, but you're, you're still able to produce it in a manner that is taking sort of a business like approach, just being really organized, um, having a plan. Uh, If you have a partner or if you have somebody who's got the same dedication, that can be very, very helpful. Um, Clearing away the distractions, setting yourself up in a, physical space that you don't have to constantly be setting up, but it's always ready and set up for you. Uh, Little things like that, you know, we're really hoping that we can help people uh, to, to be able to reach their own goals in that way, because we know that our own show is communicating to people uh, kind of a sense of freedom, a fictional world. It's giving them some, some comedy comic relief perhaps, and it's giving them some, some music, but we can also help people who have something something inside themselves that they also want want to uh, want to communicate. So I, I think that that's for me at least like that's a big driver is I would like to help people um, by by showing them what what we've accomplished and maybe somehow modeling it or uh, putting it out there, giving examples like concrete examples, you know, of like here's how to do a Trello board, you know, or here's exactly how you have to set up your podcast if that's what you want to do. Or here's how, if you want to be a musician and you're doing it from home, here's how you, you re- like, this is what has worked, you know, for us uh, so that other people can, can also have that. Because it is a transformative experience when you actually are able to take something that you love, develop it into something that can go public. You know, it, it really, uh, it really transforms your life. It's been so wonderful for Jason and myself individually and as a as a team and as a as a married couple you know to be able to go through this this whole journey together it's been like it's not been easy like I can just definitely tell you that it's definitely Mm -hmm. hard work but you you get so much from it if you approach it sort of with that positivity with an approach of like, it's backbreaking, like Jason always says, it's backbreaking, it's breaking my spine, is what he's always saying. Joyful treadmill. 
<laughs> it's it's the what did you say? The, it's the joyful treadmill. It's the joyful treadmill. Like it's it's joy. It's work. You're doing it because it's meaningful to you. It's it's but but you're always looking at the joyful part. So you're willing to put in the work, but you're always looking at that goal, and you're never letting it just be crushed. You know, like you're never just doing it for. You're never just doing it for money. Like of course we want to transform it into something that's profitable, but if we if we're never taking a shortcut with that, so we never want to decrease the value of what we're producing in order to make that money. We always want to preserve that gold because we know it's gold, you know, because mm-hmm. people have told us how it gives them, you know, just a little bit of respite. It just lifts your spirits a little bit. It's not political. So it takes you away from the politics of the moment. If that's what's bothering you, you know, it's, it's freeing to know that uh, characters on the show are, just as crazy or probably crazier than than you are and and that's okay like they actually survive and they're okay and go through these crazy decision you know decision moments in their life and and everything's um everything's gonna be okay that's kind of how it is on on our show and uh so we're never going to destroy that in order to get from the hobby stage to the audience stage uh, so, th- you know, that's if, if we can possibly succeed at that and also share how we succeeded, then I think that we've really helped people in about as much. <laughs> uh, we've had as big of an impact as we possibly can have with our show. Sure. And I, I think it's so funny. I'm curious, <clears throat> just because we rewatched The Help uh, a little bit ago, uh, the movie The Help. Ho- hopefully you guys have seen it. If you haven't seen the movie The Help, you've got to go watch the movie The Help. I love The Beatles. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that, so in, in your Smileton village, if your friends or the other people in your town are listening to your show, do they like hear, Oh, this character was made out of me. This like, or, or is it separated enough that the people in your own town don't see themselves in your stories? It's funny. The, there are people, some of the characters are based on, well, at least one I can think of for sure, it was based on a kid I went to school with very loosely, just a few things that I, that I, a few little aspects I really make, that really make me smile. But mostly it really is made up out of whole cloth. And we actually have had, we have um, a character who's sort of my nemesis in town and we've had him on the show. So my friend who's been listening since episode one voices him. So he is Jorg in a sense. Like I didn't know what Jorg's voice was going to sound like. And he came out with this perfect voice and we butt heads on the show periodically. It's going to be coming up again soon. We have a new storyline planned for that. And it really is um, the, I I'm sure there are a lot of real life analogs to what goes on in Smiletham, but it has never been conscious. And it's sort of just thinking back, oh yeah, well that would be where I got that from. Like I like it in the moment when we're when we're kind of brainstorming and we're doing stuff, we're really not that conscious of it. But I'm sure you could tie it to all kinds of things. Yeah. The, the mayor of Smileton um is a, is 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 another one of my nemeses. I'm I have a nemesis or around every corner in Smileton. So I always call her our inept corrupt mayor, Patty Pepper. And she, and she's like a small town mayor and her family's been in the town forever. And it's this kind of thing. She runs a town and I butt heads with her as well. Um, but in the, in the real city where we're in, like has a woman mayor, but th- th- that's like, I think that's probably where I got the idea. Like uh-huh. that's, that's my town. That's what they, we do. We do, we do have a, a mayor who is the woman, but beyond that, it's all completely just made up, made up stuff. Also, if I could add, if I could just briefly add, um, Smileton, we call it the podcasting capital of the world. And the reason is our sort of our idea with that is that like Miss Elizabeth has 91 other podcasts that she's recording and some of them she's recording while (laughs) she's recording the Smile Syndicate Music (laughs) Hour. (laughs) So I'm actually working on other podcasts like while Jason is talking and doing like doing other segments of the show. So so I have 91 other podcasts. So I have other co-hosts that I'm doing podcasts with. These are fictional, of course, like everything is fictional. And we actually have a segment where it's like um, Liz's miss elizabeth's podcast rundown where i give um i give uh like summaries of what happened like some of the most interesting stories that happened in 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 the podcasts so all of the townspeople the idea is they're all also on podcasts so it it never really occurs to them to be bothered by the fact that they're on like their subjects on on our podcast because 
everybody's podcasting about everybody like all the time, you know, in, in Smileton. And, um, and the other thing is that some people don't have their own podcast, apparently, such as Lance Brock, uh, who, who is the yes, mu- musician friend of, of Jason and has a guitar shop, which is a terribly run down. Don't even get <laughs> that started. Guitar it's the best shop. guitar shop in town. Miss Elizabeth doesn't enjoy Lance's uh, Lance's segments, but he writes a segment, and he uh, and he gives it to Jason, who reads it on on the show. So people actually want seem to want to be on our show, and their characters they write segments and and they get to be on the show. So um, uh, nobody's mm-hmm. really bothered; they they just want to be on the show. It seems. Well, I, so I need it. I definitely need to go actually listen to it. I, I'm curious. <clears throat> uh, do, for, for, we're, I'm gonna have to separate you, you two sure. from like reality and 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 uh, Smileton Village. Okay, yeah. Yeah. so let's let's step into reality for a second. Uh, <laughs> and by the way, we will. My, I am severely creatively challenged. Uh, to, to to preface this, like my, I had to. Uh, I think it's just due to my childhood and the way I was raised. It was very real, very raw. Uh, in, in, abuse, in an abusive situation and it was survival. And so there wasn't a lot of time to play cops and robbers or, you know, wh- there wasn't a lot of play. It was like actually surviving, you know, and mm-hmm. you could try and make a game out of surviving, but at the end of the day, surviving was surviving. <clears throat> and so um, I, I have throughout my life had to work at being creative. And it's like, it is a struggle. It takes an enormous amount of energy to dream and to think, okay, what would I want with if I had X amount of whatever of unlimited time or unlimited money or whatever, what would I actually want? Cause my mind is so stuck in survival that it's hard. It's been hard for me to get there. So I'm curious, what was the catalyst that was like, you know what? I need a creative outlet. What was it that said that was like happening in actual life around you that was driving you towards this need for a creative outlet? I think Really, it was having kids. Uh, we had uh, we have two kids. They're fifteen and thirteen now. Um, but back when this idea originally percolated, they were four and two, and that we had just we were, that was sort of just through the period where they need twenty four seven attention, right? So now they've been sleeping through the night a long time. Uh, the older one is going to be going to kindergarten soon. You know, they're they're, they're becoming their own people. And they can amuse themselves for a little bit. And that was sort of getting, getting some free, freeing up our headspace a little bit. And I, and I really went through a conscious thing of there are things that I didn't like about me that I wanted to work on because I didn't want to pass that on to the kids. And being intensely introverted was part of that. So I did a foolish thing. Um, I always not liked going on amusement park rides. And I thought, we're going to go to Disneyland at some point. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to be, oh, you know, dad has to stay back and then because, you know, he's scared or whatever. I didn't want that. It's like, no, kids, it's fun. Let's go. So I thought, well, I'm going to get on a roller coaster and let's go. So we live near Edmonton. Why did you choose the Mind And they have a, yeah, they have a mo- indoor roller coaster called the Mind Bender, which has like two, like you go right around and it's apparently one of the more intense roller coasters around. <laughs> so, and I was thinking, I've seen 11 year old kids get on the roller coaster so like i can do it so we made it we made a special trip just liz and i to go and oh we left God, the kids Sam, with my I mom i did not know i didn't realize he was going to talk about, this is hilarious this is oh, what it yeah is it is hilarious <laughs> so, so what ended up happening is like we get there my anxiety kicks in i was like i don't want to do this. this is a bad idea i don't want to do it but then i literally look at the lineup and where do i see two 11 year old kids standing there they must have been they were young right I said, well, they're doing it, so I'm going to go do it. So I got it. I got going. I got got in line and get in the thing, and it starts going up the hill, and you go way up on this thing. And I kind of was mentally preparing myself. Where I was like, well, one is it's probably going to go faster than I th- than I think. You know, that when you get pulled up the hill, that's probably going to be faster. I can't remember what the second thing I was making an assumption about. But we get up to the top, and we're about to crest, and then it, we start going down. And I was like, uh, too much, too much, too much, too much. And it just, I got flooded completely. And I slammed my eyes shut for the entire ride. And I'm going up and it's like 360, like just right around loop the loop twice and r- really quick going in circles and just, I get put through the ringer. I'm like, my body's flying around. It was horrible. I finished the ride and then I get off and I was like, 
oh, I, and then you, I felt so sick. I was so wobbly. My stomach was just completely upside down. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, a show, it's like the biggest mall in North America. There's tons of people everywhere. And I'm, and, and I'm like sitting hunched over on a bench and I just make the decision. It's okay to throw up in the garbage. <laughs> can. Like I'm, I don't care who's looking. Uh-huh. I've made the decision that this can happen now. Fortunately, it didn't. But that thing took me 24 hours to get over. So that was, that was actually, that's how I act on the show is that I get an idea, but then I take it to such a dumb, ex- like a ridiculous extreme. There was a, probably an easier ride to go on than that one. They call it the mind bender. Like it's I should not, have started with the baby, the, best beginner. <laughs> the baby hill buggy ride or something like that. So that's where it came from. I think is I've always had, I've always been trying to like, my friends and I had a silly band when, uh, you know, when we were just out of high school and I tried to do a comic, but I can't draw. I did that when I was like 10. So there's always been this, this thing pushing to, to be creative at something. And I thought I'd, that's where the, I think that's probably where it came from is that if I'm going to do it, I got to do it now. And I want to model something for the, for the kids where if you have, if you have something like you can develop a skill, if you like be creative, get it out. Mm-hmm. And about your comments, I thought they were really interesting because what I have noticed about when I'm writing for the show or working on a song, it's when it basically, I think creativity can flow out of us. And when it doesn't, it's because we're getting in the way. It's not because we aren't, aren't working hard enough to make it happen. It's because we have blocks. We're, we're blocking ourselves. Um, we get anxious about the effort, the skill we have, the amount of time we have. And all that just throws up roadblocks. And one of them might not be much, but enough of them will stop you. So we, Liz mentioned earlier, we have the podcast. I'm sitting at the table right now where we do the show. It's, it stays set up. The microphones are right here they're always like it's it's us just sitting down and clicking record and going like you you really have to eliminate all the little blocks there'll be external ones but the the really the showstoppers will be internal and it's sort of it's it always comes back to breathe go easy on yourself and it'll come out i love it i love it i mean i have so many ideas of like things that i'm gonna do we're gonna talk about some of them but one one more thing here before i jump into uh, to some other things, but again, real life. Cause there's, there's, uh, I think there's immense value. In fact, there's a, <clears throat> I forget who it was, but they were talking about, and I'm not calling you guys insane at all. Okay. Yeah. So don't take this the wrong way. <laughs> but when, when you're dealing with people who have dementia and they're, they've, they've lost all reason and they're living in another time zone. It's like, uh, I think shutter Island is this like fantastic, representation of this um except for in shutter island the guy was traumatized and it was it was a scary place for him but you know if somebody's living in their own little happy land just because they can't handle reality anymore what's the ethical thing to do is it ethically right at that point to like medicate them and force them back into this unhappy reality or do you just like help them be happy where they are and not take their gift of psychosis away from them <laughs> or schizophrenia away from them because like, they're just happier there, you know? So, um, so I'm trying to separate these two, but for, for this specific question, what, did, what were you guys doing for income? Cause it's all fun and games to like live in this imaginary world. And it definitely can relieve stress and, and all of those things. But like at some point, you know, there is real life. You have kids. I, my kids right now, they're two boys and they're two and four years old. And they're a lot of work. Like, I'm grateful for them because they help me be creative. And they're like, dad, this happened. And I'm like, okay. My wife's listen to them. They're telling you a story. I'm like, okay, I'm trying to like process this story. And then I'm like, what did they just say? Cause I don't understand their words. And so I, it's a time when it's needed, but what were you doing for income or maybe you're still doing it that really is like providing for your family. Cause that's a, that's a whole nother stress that can, be debilitating for some people to allow themselves into this creative space. So if you can speak to that just a little bit before we move on, that'd be great. Sure. Uh, basically. Yeah. We're when, uh, when the kids arrived, Liz stayed home and looked after the kids and I, I went to work. I kept working at my normal job in information technology and that became, uh, that was also uh, a factor because after you have kids, you become very conscious of the, like how, what a commodity time is and you don't have a lot of it. So you got to spend it wisely. So when it initially started, we had a small enough scope, uh, a small enough ambition for the show where it seemed like we can, we can do this with the current setup. 
kids are getting older. Liz started a business at home. She builds websites. She has like a communications consulting and graphic design and website, website design and all that. So she's, she's been growing that for the last 10 years and it's getting bigger and bigger. All the while we're working on the show. So I'm working at my job and moving forward in what I do. So there is a lot of time uh, constraints. So we uh, really, a big piece of advice I think I have for when you're trying to do something like this is really interrogate what you're doing. Like, how are you spending the time? What is it like you want, you really want to be skeptical with the way you're approaching getting it done because there are going to be, you, you will surprise yourself. We thought one show a week was barely possible. And then we just, we, we got to the point where we refined the process enough where it started becoming, we didn't sweat it. We could do it. And now it's like, well, now it's time. Let's make it difficult again. Let's do two a week. And now we're going to be at the point where we kind of think, yeah, we can keep our heads above water doing it with that. So um, Liz helped a lot with the mindset for that because I was like, how do you, like, I, I wasn't, again, I was in my own way. I thought, I don't have time. I'm not going to be able to do a proper job. You know how long it takes to do a song? Like, where is that time going to come from? Mm-hmm. And Liz had gotten into uh, Sean McCabe um, in his Sean West community, and he'd put out a book called Overlap. And it was like, how do you keep going in your job while you're pursuing your, your dream? You want to enable a transition period where you're still working to pay the bills, but you're making your dream real as well. And there were a lot of concrete suggestions in that book stuff about the buffer stuff about reusing material repurpose um uh consistency if you're not showing up once a week like if you think you can do it every second week or every month that's not frequent enough you got to do it at least once a week you got to be in front of people and a lot of that was like okay it's do it's possible so let's go and just get moving yeah, I, I think that that's incredible. So now we're, we're going to move past that. So thank you for, for addressing that. For all of you who are listening about and asking that same question, hey, dreams are fun and games, but like I got, I'm so worried about X, Y, and Z. There's a million ways to skin a cat. And uh, I, I, I'm a fan of make sure you're financially stable before you go jump into something um, completely brand new and fresh. That's just my natural, like I really like to have a sense of I'm in control. It's not stressful security. Like I really like that. And when that's being taken away from me, I don't love it. Um, On the same hand, I like being in positions that again, they're, they're very controlled positions um, that I do feel like I'm drowning. And I feel like, man, if I can just survive, that'd be great because that's, that's kind of the excitement, the adrenaline rush of, of growing. Um, But you, you mentioned one thing that you did and I, uh, and I think this is so amazing that I, and i've never heard it put this way um but for anybody who's suffering from imposter syndrome really quick have you guys heard of either liz or jason have you guys heard of clubhouse uh yeah you mean that the new app that's out that you can talk to people <clears throat> are you yeah. guys on clubhouse yes we're on clubhouse oh good yeah, yeah you so- can find us at smile syndicate at smile syndicate okay yeah. so this is this is the cool thing about um, well, I don't know if it's cool or whatnot, but Clubhouse, I speak around the, the, the country and I've spoken in, in other countries. And it's just fascinating to um, to think that you can get on stage in front of people and it's not scary. But then this Clubhouse app comes out and I can be on Facebook Live. I can be on Instagram. Not scary. But then Clubhouse comes out and I'm like, I get knots in my stomach still to get on somebody's stage and, and speak on Clubhouse. And there's no real reason to be nervous because everybody's in the same boat. And we're all just having fun, I think, as far as I'm aware. If they're not, that's unfortunate for them, <laughs> um, <laughs> you know. But, but imposter syndrome is a, a real thing. It happens to people in all areas of their life from parenting, um, working, professionally, religiously. I mean, it happens everywhere. Um, I, I love your guys' strategy to overcome imposter syndrome. You completely falsified where you were at. (laughs) 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 I love it though, because the reality is sometimes, um, our current story doesn't give us the confidence where we're at, but you said, you know what? Well, this isn't my current story. My current story is I already, this is my 17th album. Yeah. (laughs) My current story is this is my 17th album, right? And here's all of the albums. Here's all of the reviews. 
And they loved it. Everybody loved it. And so that's why I made a 17th album. And I just think what other areas of our lives would we be benefited from if we wrote 17 successful stories to support the story that we believe we want to believe, yeah. right? If we if we actually took the time and invested the time to say, look, I'm a millionaire or I'm a I'm a billionaire, right? That's that's where that's my current reality. So to get there, I'm gonna write a book of how I got to become a billionaire. Exactly. Yeah. You know, and you wrote all the you stacked up all this fictitious as it was, fictitious evidence of what you did to become a billionaire. Mm-hmm. And you can say it's fiction. I mean, that's fine. Like, go sell it in the fiction section at Barnes & Noble. Somebody will buy it, like, How I Became a Billionaire, even if it's in the fiction section or the, what what do they call that when it's, like, part real, real, part fiction? Fictional biography? What do they call those? Like, something like that. Something like that. There's got to be some book, uh, (laughs) some some section like that, right? But if it's, like, a, a fictional biography and and you just write this fictional biography how i became a billionaire and you write this wonderful story even if you're dead broke you'll get i mean you will eventually level up and the advice you'll be giving is what would a billionaire give what type of advice would a billionaire give so i think that that is incredible i'm curious where else in your life did, have you used that strategy of like stacking up fictitious wins to give you the confidence to go kill it what where you needed to kill it i think liz should answer that one because well she, with her web business oh actually yeah okay yes okay so i came up with my my website my website business i when the kids were were very young i believe i believe daniel was two so daniel was two then i had a baby <laughs> as well and i decided I need to do something because I always did well in school. And I, I, I also had a, um, like a very short lived uh, career as an educator um, until I started the family. And, um, and I needed to, and you have like two years off, like you start to kind of crawl the walls, like creatively, like I didn't have time. It's not like I had, you know, all that much uh, mental energy, mental space, or, you know, uh, or physical energy or, or time, you know, so I, I just had to do something. So I decided I'm going to learn what is this crazy thing people are doing called blogging. I'm going to learn the heck out of this. And it's totally silly. And I didn't believe I didn't have any inkling that it would turn into anything at all for me. Uh, so I just started, I think I got into like blogger, whatever blog spot, whatever it used to be. And I started to learn, you know, what is a website, and I just started to literally teach it to myself in order to learn how can I have the best possible blog for myself. And we didn't have any money to to put towards this at all. And I started to realize, well, you need money to put towards this if you want to accomplish certain things with your website. Like you want it to, you want to have a little bit better control. Maybe you want to offer a shop, but you don't want to be controlled by these these e-shops that started to crop up, but they didn't allow you to do exactly what you wanted to do with them. So I thought, well, there's got to be a way, this is the internet, this is code, you know, there's got to be a way to literally just be free and be able to do whatever I want on the internet. And so uh, that's when I realized if I have to spend money on it, that means I need to be making money from my, from my website. And that means I should be really doing this for businesses who are going to be making money. So I can, I can apply my what I've learned about website design and website development and how to, you know, how to set these things up and, and how to manipulate the code and how to make them more specific towards the, you know, actually solving these puzzles. That's what I really loved about it. I didn't really want to just write a diary for the web for the, for the internet. I really was just like solving problems and solving puzzles and putting things together, you know, building systems to address certain solutions. I think that's where my mind likes to be. You know, I like it to be in a creative zone, but I like to be like solving puzzles. You know, so it's like the graphic design, but it's also the content. And then the idea is like, get the money, get the money from the customer, you know, like get the money from the customer. How do you do that? That's a puzzle. You know, you have to solve that puzzle in order to do that, to make them decide to pass the money forward. So for me, that's always, um, that, that was always kind of what was exciting about web development and what kind of drove me forward. And building a business and calling yourself a business, 
creating your name and creating like your your graphic design around your, your like your whole brand that definitely was like a huge leap of faith um and i'd have to say that i didn't really take it as a leap of faith like i kind of started by doing what i think a lot of people do especially young people which is that you sort of shop yourself out as a beginner and you say like like let me do your website and i'll do it for basically for free you know and you sort of underestimate what you what you can what you what value you're offering what value you're adding to that to that business and i think that it wasn't until really until i got into sean west and, and i haven't been a member of sean west for probably for years now but i would recommend uh people check check him out with his whole overlap concept and the whole community that he's got going it's worthwhile because if you can figure out within yourself how much value you're potentially adding to other people's situations and how much they 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 will will come forward you know with with what the value is that you know that you should be earning on on each project say for example if it's a web development or any kind of a project like that you know it's really hard to kind of build yourself to be able to say I'm a consultant from being like a stay-at-home mom, for example. So that's the kind of leap, you know, that I was that I was having to make, like, as just a business owner, you know. And also, calling yourself a business owner is kind of strange because it's not like you went and bought bought a business; like you built it. You built it, and it's kind of imaginary. Like that's kind of the whole the whole thing about businesses is that you just imagined it and then you started doing it, and now you're a business owner. What? What yeah, does that I mean, mean? Like, what does that right? mean? It just be continue to be a hobby, but I, I think there are, and and this is something I actually speak and train on is there are some different my, like different metrics that from when you go from hobby town to like, hey, we're going to start running this as a business. Then you start tracking the analytics, you start tracking the stickiness, you start wondering, hey, who, how many people, where are they from? What what cities do they live in? How can I make this more relatable to that city? Right. I, I, so th- those are things that I think when you do actually turn it into a business, your mind does go other places, but you're exactly right in the fact that it just, it comes out of you just deciding you're a business and then you're a, a, you're a business. Exactly. It's a decision that you make in yourself and you, you have to sometimes have the, you have to have, the, it's audacious. It's an audacious decision. Sometimes you're saying, you're saying, I know I can do this, but, and you kind of are small inside yourself. And then you have to, you have to be able to say, I'm, I'm this. And sometimes you need somebody to, to maybe help you, you know, to, to be able to help you say, okay, this is what you're actually doing. And then you have to do it, wear it like a piece, like a new dress. You know, you have to wear it like a suit, like a suit of armor, even, you know, and, and you have to actually put it out there even if you're not confident, you have to act confident. And then what happens is like over time, it becomes, it becomes real. But, you know, I had this idea as you were talking before as well, Sam, where you're saying, you know, what if somebody had a different idea of what reality was, is it really right to take them away from that, from that idea? But you were talking about um, like a real mental condition, but in, in my mind, in my way of looking at things, I think that we're all constantly telling uh, telling our own story to ourself. We're, we're all telling a certain story. And is it real? It seems to be real. But what if you told a different story that also lined up with the facts? Would that also be real? It could also be real. And sometimes that's like the difference between being happy and joyful or being confident or being depressed, you know, or being full of anxiety. And sometimes the story that we're telling, I think, I think has... I, I mean, it builds, it builds our experience and everybody's having a different kind of a story playing in their mind as they're going around the same world. Like we're all in the same world. We're all telling different stories. And a lot of us are having very, very different experiences, some very, very positive and some very, very negative. I think that if you start with story, and I think that's like story is really important. I, I think that's why we in, incorporate stories so strongly in, in our podcast is that story story like it's so important to the human experience it's how we experience reality it's how we make meaning out of reality it's how we go from where we are to you know to where we want to be and it it's not it's not necessarily fiction story is not necessarily fiction like story can be fictional it can be disjointed from reality but it can also just be 
how, like where we see ourselves going. And if we see ourselves going in a certain direction, that's, that's a story. But what if that's not ideal? What if we could change our story and make it better? You know, that's fiction, sort of. But what if we made it real? Now it always was fact. It's fact. It's fact in the future, and it always was fact. So story is important. It's important to how we live. It's important to how we see ourselves. It's important to every, every part of our life, I think, to our, just our everyday experience. I, I could not agree more um, with that. And I think anybody who's listening to this needs to rewind it, go back like a minute and a half, two minutes, and re-listen to that because I believe personally that that's the key to happiness. One, recognizing what story you're telling yourself, and two, changing your story. I have journals created about this on the questions to ask yourself to rewrite your story and re-review how every experience um, that you've had is. You can't change the past yet. Uh, I really do believe that you can change the past because you can change the lens in which you view it. And the moment you change the lens, in, the lens in which you view your past, your past is different because mm-hmm. the meaning of your past is different. The meaning of your day is different. And so I cannot agree more with that statement. I would say, please just rewind it and re-listen to it and really think <laughs> deeply about what Liz just said, um, because that concept <clears throat> from my perspective is the key to happiness. And if you listen to most successful people, listen to Elon Musk and his life and his vision for the world, um, Bill Gates, love him or hate him, doesn't matter. Uh, Guy who created Apple, I forget his name right now, Steve Jobs, right? So all of these people, um, or Martin Luther King Jr., he was, his day was just a few weeks ago, right? Like he had a dream. All these people, they saw a vision of what, the future was, and they chose to live in the reality of decades in the future. And everybody else said, you are crazy, right? You want a computer in every household? Are you crazy right now? We each have, like, we're talking about this before. I'm turning off all my electronics. I got five or six computers smaller and in a more compact area than, I mean, the, the whole computer when he said that was bigger than the room I'm in, you know? So it's, Mm -hmm what reality do you choose to live in? And this isn't a condemnation to you if you're choosing to live in a reality that brings you sadness and sorrow and pain and all that. I'm not condemning you and saying you're bad and wrong for choosing to live there, but it's more of an invitation to, to consider choosing to live somewhere else. That's all. It's an invitation to choose to consider, like to consider choosing living in a happier place. So along those lines, and this is a question for Jason, I think, and we'll find out who, who's the best answer to this, but I believe it's for Jason. Because the other thing that I loved about what you said, not only creating your story, but so often, we just, especially when we're starting out, we don't have any fans. Nobody knows who we are. Yet, that doesn't eliminate the need, or, or especially when you're building up your confidence, if you want to have fans, there's nothing wrong with creating fans. So I was on the filming. I don't know if you've ever heard of this movie, uh, Forever Strong. It's about rugby. It was filmed t- here in Utah, or parts of it were. And um, in, in the stands, when you're, when you're watching a movie and you see all these stands of people, <clears throat> it's so easy to think, no, they actually either had all these people there um, or they computer generated them, right? Well, a lot of times they weren't computer generating them. Literally, when I was in this film, they would film these big like uh, championship game, like football game, rugby games, and they had blow up dolls throughout all of the stands. Like every third or fourth person was a blow up doll. And so when they'd say, hey, everybody, like do the wave, right? You'd see some people not stand up because... (laughs) <laughs> they aren't actual people, right? So when you're creating a movie, when you're creating a movement, it's okay to bring some fake people. It's okay to just create fake people. And I love that you guys did that for your show. Hey, what are the guests? So this person, yeah. Joey, wrote in from Arkansas, right? And it's like, there's no Joey. There's probably, yeah. I mean, there is an Arkansas, right? So use some fictitious <laughs> name, but... Yeah. Who was the, the, the idea creator behind that? And how did you come up with the reviews or the questions that somebody would have about your little town or about your, your, your podcast? There's, there's different, that, we've done different approaches for that. Sometimes Liz will suggest them because if I'm the one doing writing all the time, I'm coming at it from 
similar angles. And Liz will come at it from a completely different angle that I wouldn't think of. And I'll react to it on the show. And then that'll be that, that we like that dynamic a lot. Um, we have, we do a, we, so during our mailbag segment, um, sometimes the questions come from a place where I want to forward a certain story element in Smileton. Cause we usually have lots of little threads going on, lots of different characters doing things and they keep cropping up in different places. So sometimes it's, t- it's time for there to be a discussion of it in the mailbag. So we'll throw it in there. We have, uh, we, um, I thought it'd be funny for me to like act like I'm super cool. So I'm going to, I'm going to wrap with the kids. I'm going to share some wisdom with the kids. I'm going to sit in a circle with the kids on the floor. We're just going to, we're just going to wrap. So uh, the conceit is that uh, uh, kids at the Smileton elementary school have sent in questions. So I'm just going to give rapid fire answers to them. So Liz peppers me with the questions and, and then just the questions are, most of them aren't questions. They're bizarre, like, there's all kinds of crazy things happening in Smileton and the kids are not, you know, they're active participants in it. So it's just a bunch of off the wall, crazy things happening. And I keep complaining of the kids in this town have a screw loose. And there's an ongoing thread about kids writing in to complain because they paid me 20 bucks to do their homework and they got a bad grade. And I'm like, well, you're, <laughs> I didn't guarantee any, qu- I didn't guarantee a grade. I guaranteed something you could turn in and claim to be yours. And they, if you have any complaints, maybe next time do your own homework. You know? <laughs> So it's it is a mix of of, of different kinds of uh, different kinds of approaches for that. But I think um, when you were talking, it was making me think of the, the idea of you know when we're telling our own stories, the context that you're in really colors how you're perceiving things. And very like a super concrete example is Liz and I are doing the show, and um, I'm always assuming it's not going well. Or I always am in, I'm not secure that we're doing a good job a lot of the time. So you'd laugh if you heard the unedited, unedited audio, because we'll finish a segment. We're going into a song and then I'll go, is that all right? Like, yes, it was fine. Let's keep going. And so it sounded a certain way when it was coming out of my mouth. And then I edit the show later and I clean it up and I put the songs in and I get it all polished up and ready to go out the door. So that's a different experience and I'm hearing it. Like I was there, but now it's a different, it, the context is different. I'm hearing it a different way. Now I'm not, now I'm listening for stuff I want to trim out, hesitations, stumbling over words, that kind of thing. So I still haven't heard the show. I have to listen when it's out for real on, on the feed. Then we'll often just take a drive and listen to the show as though, you know, just as a podcast listener, and it'll sound different again. And now we can evaluate, like, because we I, I make a point where i have to listen to every show because i'm trying to learn like what worked what didn't we need to trim that we could have gone longer there and now we turn in shows that are pretty consistent in terms of length like we kind of have a rhythm now and i think if you're creating anything you have to approach it from those perspectives like don't worry about it when you're in the heat of it it's going fine don't question it that's for later and then when you're preparing it for consumption then you can get critical but you're still not hearing it so just use your you know, use your judgment at the time, but you won't know if what you think of it until you're consuming it, just like your, your audience is. Mm -hmm. So always do that. We have heard of podcasters who say, Oh, I never listened to my stuff. And it's like, you have to, Yeah, anything you put up. I listened to every one of my episodes. Yeah. Why you listen to your thing? Same thing. I'm like, cause when I'm, when I'm listening and I'm interviewing, it's a, it's an, another level of active listening that is, I'm listening with the ears of like, what would somebody want me to ask? Yeah. You know, what, yep, what's going exactly. to benefit my audience. And then when I listen to it back, I'm like, man, I said something really good. Or my guest just like, whoa, yeah. that blew my mind. And it wasn't something that I even heard the first time around. I didn't make a note of it, you know, but then the yep. second around when I'm listening to it as an audience member, I'm like, man, that was really cool. Why doesn't more people listen to this? You know, yeah. so. <laughs> so just like just it's, it's kind of always just goes back to go easy on yourself trust what you're doing in the moment like you're doing your best you, you you've got you're coming in with experience and even if you aren't you're you're going to do it right or if you don't do it right you're going to learn from it and you'll do it right the next mm-hmm. time and practice practice and reiteration is really really has a huge impact on on the product but sam you were talking about um about our fictional audience that we kind of create that sends in letters and we also have kind of a a stadium style or like a like an audience booth kind of like looking in on us that that we kind of we we sort of talk to and we have a laugh track that we sometimes play and it's usually just 
trying like we you know we played it they're usually laughing at us more so than than with us you know when, when I hit that laugh track we've almost developed the like the audience when they send in a mailbag uh, letter they're often being a little bit insulting like they might be insulting the show or they're, they're like missing the the point of the show or they're they 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 sort of misidentify you know where we are or what the subject of our show is and or they blame us for not having like certs like more cooking on the show or something it's not a cooking show so that we don't have that but then they're like very derogatory about the show so we sort of we sort of build in this like existing audience that we imagine that we might have but they're almost like they're listening and they're like they're listening so much to our show that they're a little they're like complaining about it now it's like we sort of, that's kind of almost what we want with our show i think i think that might be our fantasy is that so many people are listening that it becomes like casual they're casually listening and they're like now they're kind of like nit- nitpicking you know at the show that's a real. That's interesting. It just because we we're, we're very careful to distinguish the studio audience here with a, with us in Smile Syndicate HQ. I'll complain about them. I'm always threatening to turn the fire hose on them. They're never paying attention. That kind of stuff. And the people who send messages to us through the pneumatic tube, they're always rude. People write in rude things in the mailbag. So it's, it is funny when it's pointed out that like there's such a combative relationship with the the imaginary audience, but. Yeah when we, we always address the listener individually. So it's always dear listener friend, you're listening to, you are listening to us. Thank you so much for listening. Your time is precious. You know, we have a sacred responsibility to keep you entertained for the next hour or so we treat it like that. So we're always addressing the podcast listener as dear listener friend. It's not guys. It's not a group. It's only one person. And then we, we direct the show to them. So I will say, like, do you see how Miss Elizabeth treats me, dear listener friend? This is outrageous, you know, <laughs> that kind of stuff. So it is a fun thing to kind of want to keep that straight where I start complaining, but we have to, like, I always have to keep it in the back of my mind. I have to make it clear that I'm not complaining about the actual audience. I'm complaining about this fictional audience. I don't know what it says about me that I also have to create a fictional audience. And in my dreamland, they would be <laughs> inattentive, hostile, <laughs> combative. <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't matter what it says about you. It's fun. Like, that's yeah, exactly. fun. So I'm curious, because you guys have been doing this for at least two years now. It sounds like about almost three um, and maybe more. Yeah. And now your kids are older. This is, I mean, I'm, we're going to have to speed this up a little bit because yeah, we're sure. running out of time and it's, it's stressing me out because I love this. But how involved are your kids? Like, are they making guest appearances on? Are they also helping you write the storylines? Like, hey, mom, this would be really funny if you said this. And if you did this, dad, this would be hilarious. Like, are they actively engaging in that creative process as well with you guys? We have made the the conscious decision not to, not to kind of... Um use our kids you know for 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 example like to put them on youtube as as a way to as a way to generate more interest um and so we've never kind of we've never kind of tried to put them in into that kind of a a scenario i'm not even sure jason if we would have them on if you know if that came up as a serious thing i'm not even sure if we would i think that we're very hesitant to use them because of the idea of using your kids, you know, to, to make your show better. We would want them to be compensated properly and to be treated properly. We're very protective of our children. <laughs> you know? well, have like, they expressed interest? Like they want yeah. to be involved? They, 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 ha- they don't really appear on the show, but they have contributed material. They've contributed ideas uh, in the mailbag segment with the rap and with the kids. I thought, get them to do the questions so that's where the crazy kid questions came from because what they put in as questions were they were crazy off the wall stuff my daughter had some stuff i never would have thought of very strange questions so th- they like contributing like that and we've involved them on the technical side we were trying to actively do a lot of video stuff um and there was a lot of camera switching in that so we tried to get the k- kids involved in that and they've contributed to songs my son um just kept going boop boop banana bus boop boop banana bus and I thought well that's got to be a song because that's sticking in my head so that mm-hmm. I did a song and it's called banana bus and it's our most popular song by a country mile yeah it's been the number one song on our Spotify and where everywhere else um, ever since we put it out and it's all and it just it came from it came from that and, and, from the, and the kids and the sing kids at the sing end all it. four of us sing at the end 
So that's the only time that all four of us have been on like something that's out for consumption. Yeah, that's cool. I I, I just wonder because it's a uh, it's always fun to see a family unit kind of grow together and create something uh, of beauty and and enjoyment and laughter and and really mm-hmm. allow them in. Um, I don't keep my kids off social media, but I also don't really know how to use them for social media. Like I post when I think they're cute and they're doing something cute. I'm like, Oh yeah. I, I don't think about the analytical side. I'm like, Oh, this is, this will do better if I post my kid. Like I don't, yeah. I don't even think about that. I just think I want to share this joy that I got with the world. Um, but I think that there definitely is something to be said about protecting their, their right to their own life, you know? And so that's where that question came from. So we are, <clears throat> if somebody wanted to get involved with you, either from a website design, obviously like your, your, your actual professionals as well and doing what you do on top of having this fun activity, where would they get in touch with you? Where could they uh, connect more with you? Obviously on Clubhouse, make sure you throw that t- handle down again because yeah. Clubhouse is the future for anybody listening. Absolutely. And, you know, we'll make sure that we, we connect on clubhouse. Cause I don't think that you and I are connected on clubhouse yet, but we'll, we'll do that. So that's at smile syndicate and I'll figure yours out. So, that, so that we're connected. At S Knickerbocker. At S Knickerbocker. Okay. So we must get connected and we should start doing rooms together. Yes. I think that'd be fun. I'd love to hear some of your, your banter together. Let's make, uh-huh. let's make that a plan. So uh, the best place sort of like the, the hub would be the smile syndicate, uh, dot com. So that has everything. It has all like all the major ways that you can subscribe to the podcast. It has all of the, uh, the social media. So if you want like Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram, that's all, that's all there. So just go to the smile syndicate.com and you'll find, you'll find all that stuff. But if you would like to support the show and we very much do uh, encourage you to, to come on and support the show. You can join us on either Patreon or Locals. And Locals is super fun. I don't know if you've heard of Locals. But uh, so smilesyndicate.locals.com. It has kind of a community feel where you don't have to be a member and you can see all everything that's happening. If you want to comment or you want to... Uh, put your own uh, put your own thoughts on. Then you have to you have to become a member. <clears throat> and anybody who becomes a member of either Patreon or uh, or the locals group, and you can find links to that on the website, thesmilesyndicate.com. But anybody who who does contribute, we consider them to be a citizen of Smileton. So you become a citizen of this of the of the town of Smileton, and we we mention you on the show pr- like pretty much every every time. So, and yeah, and that would be the way to get in direct contact with us uh, through the website or through uh, smilesyndicate.locals.com is probably the easiest way uh, because you can, you can message us like either way through the website or, or the other way. And if you do want a website or you want to talk about a website, um, just shoot me a message and just mention, Miss Elizabeth, I want to learn how to make a website or I, I need one for my business. Just let me know. I love I'm it. happy to help it's like, out. It's like buying a star. You can like uh, buy your own character yeah. on it. Like exactly. what, if, what if, though? I mean, like if you think about like Family Guy or American Dad or some of these TV shows that have been around for decades, right? And, and <clears throat> they're not going anywhere soon, right? They just keep continuing to make them Simpsons, things like that. What if you could like buy your own character on the show that shows up for, I don't know, one season. You buy a character in a season, even if you're ancillary, you're just like walking by and they reference you in conversation or they do something. I mean, that'd be kind of cool. I've never thought of this. So this is another way we could make money in, in the 21st yeah, century. Yeah. Um, I love it though. Like get a little card that says this is... Yeah, yeah we actually have on. citizenship cards. And, and we have, so you get a name, you have uh, Jason draws your profile. Uh, we haven't sent all of these out yet, Jason. We have to finish working on them, but I have the, the design fully completed. You get an address, and there's, there's also going to be a map of Smileton, which is also being created. So you are an actual citizen of Smileton. You have an address, and so you're part of kind of the news stories. So you can listen to the show and sort of know what's happening in your neighborhood. I and love supporters, it. Supporters have influenced the direction of the show. They've made suggestions. They've sent stuff into the mailbag and joined in creating the story and creating the world. And part of uh, what happens in Smileton is there's something strange going on and the animals have like unique abilities. So there's a Mr. Cherry's, the algebra solving horse. There's Blueberry, the world's strongest donkey. 
Grady, the uh, what, what is the, he solves calculus. integral calculus problems. Yeah. Um, so all these animals and Miss Elizabeth interacts with them, and I'm constantly denying they can do all this stuff. And she's like, so it's 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 either magical or it's not in Smileton. So we had a supporter just create. He wrote in a question about tax implications about taking his uh, his uh, cow who performs in spelling bees. Uh, over the border, so the, his his cow won a prize. So does he have to pay tax on that? So like that's the that, those are the kinds of questions we got in we get in the mailbag. And now he he made up that that spelling bee cow. So now that's that, that cow exists in Smileton now too. Yeah, I love it. I, no, I, I really do. I think it's such a unique idea <laughs> that I'm going to go listen to the show just to get the, <laughs> get into the, get into the town. I love it. Um, okay, so here is the the section called legacy on rapid fire. So um, let's have just like a little, every, every other answer comes from, from each other. Okay. So okay. Uh, we'll start with uh, Jason. We'll start with Jason. Okay. And <clears throat> the question is, what do you think, or, or what is the, what's holding you back from reaching the next level of your legacy today? You can't uh, say it's a computer. No, <laughs> no it's not a physical thing. <sighs> I think probably two things. One is just that internal doubt and wanting to stop. I'm prone to that, uh, of getting negative too easily. So I think it's just that, in, in, that, that you, can, you can get over your interior monologue or that dialogue you're go- you have going with yourself, but it never goes away. And yet that's just the constant fight. So I think I need to relax about that. I think it's an internal struggle. I just got to relax and the next the next stage isn't really shouldn't be about anything that's external it's what we have control over and this can we make this more fun to do can we make it more enjoyable can we make it even better i think that's what the next stage is and i think we just got to get out of our own way and make that happen awesome and liz what's the hardest thing you've ever accomplished oh my goodness i mean it's got to be the kids don't you think it's got to be, it's got to be, you know, having the kids. I mean, I, I'd love to say that it was, you know, to do with, with anything, but it's, it's the kids. It's, it's having the kids noticing that they're people, which, which you notice immediately, which is such a shock, by the way, to suddenly have kids and they're their own people and they're not you and they're not, they're not your partner and they're their own person. And then another, another kick in the, in the uh, shocker, I guess, is um, having another one. And it's a totally different person. It's another different person. And that's when you realize, like, this could go out of control. Like, are we going to have another one? It'll be another different human. It'll be another, like, how do people have more than two kids? Yeah, we really noticed (laughs) they're different people. And then just being able to kind of figure out who they are and, um, and try to do right by them, you know, all of the time, which is a daily concern, even though they're teenagers now. I, th- I think that we're doing pretty well. I always thought that I would go back to work when the kids could basically walk. I thought, I'm, go- I'm going back to work. Like, I need to. I need to solve puzzles. But the kids are a hard enough puzzle. And they need me enough. They really need, like enough like individual attention i really think that was the right decision for for us i think we're doing okay at it and i'm really proud of where we are with the kids. <laughs> hey i love that so, <laughs> so now jason what's your greatest accomplishment in life like what's the the capstone accomplishment up to this point i think it's just being in like having this family really i I've been around long enough now and I've met a number of different people and I've worked with different people and I've socialized with a number of different people. And it's sort of that stuff where like when you work at a marriage and you build a family and your, you, your, your focus is on them, you kind of start taking for granted, like that that's like, not everybody can get that. Not everybody can achieve that. Not everybody has the same kind of road that I've had. And it's been a lot of work and it's been a lot of commitment. We've been married more than 20 years now and we're we're still going we're doing something very challenging together and we're having fun doing it i think that's 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 the main thing like that's and it, it i i think everything else then that you want to do in your life is better because you have that i love that so uh liz what is a secret habit mindset or behavior that you believe contributes most to your success 
I, I think, I think it's maybe returning to the concept of story of when you wake, wake up in the morning, you know, make, if you, if you don't feel, if you're not feeling it, cause you weren't dreaming it, I guess, and you wake up and you're, and you're just not feeling it, being able to develop the habit, you know, to make, to make a declaration that today's going to be this way and having, just having a way of regularly being able to say it. I, I did for a while, write it down. You know, every morning I would get up and I would write down is like daily affirmations is, is I think what it's called. So I have like, I have these pads of paper and I would fill them with, they're, they're like this size. They're, they're like half, like half paper size. I, I would fill like, just fill something like that up with like as many times as I could write and then I'd turn it over and write it again. And, but I found that I could also usually do it just in my head. So like, it sounds corny, but being able to just say what you want your day to be like, you know, I, I think that that's been, that's been like a really good tool. Love that. Okay. So this is the final question. I'm so excited to have both of you answer this. So we're going to start with Jason. We're going to end with Liz. Um, but the, the question is, if you guys died, you know, let's, let's assume you guys are dead and your great, 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 great grandchildren, they're sitting around the dinner table discussing your life, the impact you had and the legacy you left. What do you want them to be saying about your legacy six generations from now? <laughs> well, the fact that they even know us is something. We must have done something right. I think it's just, you know, it's not anything major. It's, it's like, I think a lot of those things where you, you're striving for achievements and that kind of thing, and it's, those can be really great and really satisfying. But I think if they're not in the context of your relationships with people, they don't mean as much. So I think it would really be around, like they had a good family. They, they were good to the people around them. They devoted their energies to trying to make things better. They did a fun show. They, they were conscientious in their work. They were good to their neighbors, you know, that kind of thing. Nothing too flashy, but I think it's, it's kind of like it, that it's kind of down to the nub of it. Like it's how are you engaging with the world? Are you putting positive stuff out there or are you not? Love that. Okay, I, I agree with, with that, but I'm going to take a leap. I'm going to take a leap from that. I'm going to say, uh, they're going to look back at us and say, um, those are my great, great grandparents. Uh, they, they founded Smileton and Sm- like Smileton is still around. Like, so Smileton's going to going to develop from a podcast. It's going to develop into uh, into another kind of a show. It's going to develop into mul- multiple other kinds of assets, and the whole world is going to get to know Smileton. And so our our descendants are going to say, "That's Miss Elizabeth and Jason, the founders of Smileton." I love it, man. I'm looking forward to the Hulu TV show or the Netflix show where it's a series and just like continues to. Uh, it, engage me and my children together. You know, I mean, I watch lots of shows with my kids, and I think we, there's always more room for these little towns, almost like Daniel Tiger type of of town, where it's just like, what's going on? But maybe a little bit better graphics than Daniel Tiger. In my mind, I'm hearing better graphics, but maybe. Maybe not. Who knows? <laughs> Either way, it'll be fun. Uh, that's awesome. Well, thank you guys so much for sharing uh, your time with me and with the audience here. Um, I'm super excited. <laughs> Mostly, I think, for my dad to hear this, because I think my dad would be a great, like, his his dreams and aspirations, if he if he chose to do it, I think could could do something similar. Um, you just need the right catalyst, right? So it's all about the catalyst, I think. Uh, but thank you so much for your time. And uh, I hope you guys have a wonderful day and we'll definitely connect on Clubhouse. Awesome. Thank you so Thanks much for having us. Forward to that. Yep, we'll, guys, we'll catch you guys next time on the Fuel Your Legacy Show. Thanks for joining us. If what you heard today resonates with you, please like, comment, and share on social media. Tag me. And if you do give me a shout out, I'll give you a shout out on the next episode. Thanks to all of those who've left a review. It helps spread the message of what it takes to build a legacy that lasts. And we'll catch you next time on Fuel Your Legacy. Fuel Your Legacy.